Hello and welcome to episode 78 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am recording this episode on a glorious, sunny Sunday afternoon in late April 2020. The sun has been shining now for about five weeks, which is unprecedented in these parts. My son, uh, with, a, with an O, is outside rolling around in the garden completely naked, which I think is probably the best use of a garden, particularly an overlooked London garden. We can all learn from him. There's a little nest of robins in the ivy hedge uh, a few feet above his head, which is very sweet because he's there gurgling away and then you hear the, the chicks cheeping and cheeping. I think they're on the verge of fledging, so they won't be with us much longer. I am now back at work. You will hear from this podcast. We've worked out a safe working pattern that minimises contact between the gardeners and householders and other people who might be casing the joint generally. So I'm now working a sort of shift pattern. I'm in on Mondays from 7am until 7pm, Wednesdays 7am to 7pm, and Fridays 7am until it's it's reasonable to, to slink off into the, into the weekend sunset. I understand that if you are still locked in the house and unable to leave, it might be quite galling listening to what I've been up to under the blue skies in this large garden. And I don't make this episode as a gloat or to boast about the, the things I'm up to. I make it because I think that for, for some people, the garden probably matters. You've been listening to me talk about it for three years. You might have been feeling something of what I felt while I was under lockdown, wondering what was there, what was surviving, which of my plantings were, were, were failing as we sat and did nothing. And this episode is made in the spirit of that reassurance and also in the spirit that that we will soon all have to be working towards a, a sort of life goes on even if it goes on in in the strangest of ways and with the longest of shifts so we're back back to the weekend gardening and this week i am talking about the garden in high spring and how discombobulating it is to to stumble back when i left it everything was in pre-bud stage in promise stage and now i have come in full deliverance so i'm just getting to terms with that a little bit i'm also talking about some ferns cutting those back i'm talking about different types of weeding and i am talking about bluebells it's the right time of year to talk about bluebells. So without any further introductory rambling, let's get on with the week in gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening. How strange it was to arrive in the garden at 6.45am on the Monday. It was a sudden return. We worked out a deal, hammered it out on the, the night before. And I had been sitting on the sofa preparing for another day in the the limbo land another walk around the the streets around me a trip to the park it would have been a very jolly day and then at about 10 to 8 it was on i was getting up the next morning to go to work and so i did left the house at at 5 45 drove through a deserted london stopping at traffic lights with no cars around me no queue ahead or behind it felt like one of those summer holiday trips to school. I don't know if any of you ever did that, but for some reason, after three weeks of climbing trees and setting fire to things and whatever delinquency you got up to in the summer holidays, you have to go back to school for some reason. Maybe you kicked a football there or you're just up to mischief there, I don't know. And you see this place that is usually so full, so full of people and noise.
trees and an activity, empty and dead, and you realise it is just buildings. That's what London felt like. I spent the drive to work in a state of excitement and anxiety. The garden I knew would be fine. I'd only been away for three weeks, three and a bit weeks. They had been dry weeks, but they had been April dry, which is very, very different from August dry. I see a lot of watering going on at the moment, which is which is good probably, particularly for, for new plantings. But we have to remember that this sun does not have the power that it will later develop. This sun is still just creating a, a crust upon what is a very, very wet earth still. What we're doing is we're baking some sort of chocolatey pudding and we're just putting that that crispy caramelized edge to it, that really tasty bit. When we cut in with a spoon we'll see it's still oozing inside. So I wasn't worried about any of the bigger trees, the established plantings, any of the bulbs or the self-seeded things. They would look after themselves. What I was worried about were certain new plantings that I'd put in. And if you listen to this podcast, you'll know that I put in a huge amount of new planting. And I'd left detailed instructions with the the wonderful householders who find themselves with nothing to do than garden about what needed doing and what should go where and where that massive bulb order that was going to turn up in my absence should be planted. Put the eucomis over there, put the nerines there, put the, the agapanthus there. And I think I'd left instructions on what needed to be watering, but but of course there, there are bits that, that only I know about and I forget until I'm there and seeing them. And so I was slightly frightened about their survival. I had that jolt as I was driving through Regent's Park and I remembered I didn't tell anyone about the, the gauge trees that I'd planted or the pear that I moved and was in the garden already but had been moved so it needs to be treated like a new tree. Anyway, I got to work and, and unlocked and the garden was utterly, breathtakingly beautiful. I am in favour of, of most cliches because they tend to have some truth in them and this was really a, an absence makes the heart grow fonder moment. I saw all of the plants that, for very sad reasons, are my friends. And I saw, more importantly, the the things that I had gambled on last year paying off. The, the circle of tulips that I found on January the 6th lying around forgotten and unplanted, an assorted bag without labels, and I decided to shove in under a very large apple tree to mirror the drip line exactly look magnificent the apple tree is in full blossom above them in that beautiful apple blossom way when apple blossom comes out it comes out in a in a a mixture of white and a very dark pink that's almost red and then the fresh fresh green of the leaves around them and the tulips beneath there are red ones there are white ones and there are that, that fantastic tulip called Antoinette, which comes out multi-headed and yellow and slowly fades into a pink as it ages. And they do mirror the blossom above them. I've talked before on this podcast about the effect of a very, very still couple of days in late autumn when leaves fall from the tree without being disturbed by wind or gale on the way down and leave a mirror on the grass around them and how it's one of my favourite effects and I've somehow created something similar in in blossom and bulb which pleased me no end. I've missed the height of the Erythronium pagoda. I put in a, a couple of thousand of those across woodland areas and they're still up. The, the flower spikes are there and some of those fantastic jester's cap flowers are still out looking good but I can only imagine how magnificent it must have looked a week before, two weeks before. The general impression is of freshness and newness, which is what spring is about. There are some wonderful foliage tones out there, beautiful, beautiful ferns. The the Matusia, which is the most fantastic green. That's the shuttlecock fern, the one that comes out in in a big shuttlecock-like explosion like the world's most beautiful and, and fresh waste paper basket spreading up and up and out. 
The tulips generally are looking absolutely divine. I particularly enjoy the red bed where I implanted entirely red tulips. I planted 500 Uncle Tom. Those are the peony flowered red tulips I was talking about in last episode. Those are the red, those are the peony flowered deep red tulips I was talking about in last, in the last episode. I planted 500 Yan Rus, which is a beautiful classic tulip cup shaped tulip that, that has a nice deep red color and I planted 500 lasting love which is more of a pinch waisted semi lily flowered tulip with slightly lighter lips on, on, on a pinky red tone I think it looks fantastic in a bed full of emerging foliage of low and lush green there's quite a lot of Hacklecler macra, the plain green form there. It's a shady area. There's there's rosettes of of telema coming up, and ferns sprouting all over the place, as well as as emergent geranium foliage. And there, with the green below it, it looks utterly magnificent. Above it, there are some multi-stem parotia that I that I put in a few years ago, and some amelanchia, another plant that I was talking about in in the last episode of the Garden Log. Of course, as with all things, there are some renegades, some survivors from previous years planting schemes. There's one particular tulip. I can't remember which one it is now. I obviously chose it in in more exuberant days. And it is a beautiful mixture of yellow and orange in a way that only a tulip can be with that fire like pattern coming up in the middle of each petal. And it looks so jarring amazingly jarring to me it's the only thing i can see but in terms of the feedback i got about the garden this spring of course that's the one that people like i love those tulips particularly that orange one isn't it great i'm fairly lucky in that i work with a person who sincerely believes that it is impossible for flowers to clash with each other and I don't believe this at all. I think it is entirely possible, but uh, but they don't, which gives gives one a lot of leeway in the garden. In other exciting news, for for long term listeners, for the super fans, the geranium madarense that I have been nurturing from seed for the past two and a half years are budding up and beginning to flower. They've now gone through two winters. They have taken vast amounts of real estate. They have been defended on all fronts, in areas where space is limited, and they grow bigger and bigger, like a vast cuckoo in the nest, pushing out the delicate little fledgling birds around them, and getting more and more green leaf in the way. Finally, they are putting up those those looming clusters of flower bud. No one else in the garden uh, staff or, or homeowners has seen them in flower, so they don't quite know what they're in for, but I can see the heavy weight of petals pushing itself up, ready to emerge. In terms of work on Monday, I spent quite a large portion of the the morning getting reacquainted, seeing what had done well and and what had fared less well. But the advantage of working a 12-hour day is that there's loads of time to get on and still, still carry out some useful tasks. I busied myself in cutting back the old fronds on the Asplenium scolopendrium. That's the heart's tongue fern, a British native fern, you'll know it. It is the only fern without divided leaves. If you're out in the woods and you see a fern that has no branching structure, no crinkled fractal edges or or little little curly cues like you'd see on, on frost and window pane, if it's just a broad and beautiful mass of green leaf, then that's the Asplenium scolopendrium. And I left the old leaves on all winter, for in the winter they are a cheering sight. They are green, and therefore they are beautiful. And in the spring, everything is green, and suddenly the leaves of this plinium, the poor thing, look ragged and old and dark, and they need to go. I think, like a lot of things in the garden, we see things differently depending on time. It's fine to, to be raggedy in January. It's the end of a very, very long season. It's like at a, at a ball, at a, at a fantastically extravagant ball, when the sun is coming up. 
it's fine to be seen with your, your bow tie undone and your jacket discarded. But when you take the first glass of champagne from the silver platter, you need to be looking your absolute best. And now is the time for everything to be at its best. So I chopped off those old leaves, tarted the plant up, got it back to, to fresh viridian green, got it back to the sensual column of now completely upright, unfurling fronds. And at this moment, they grow so quickly. All of their growth happens in about two weeks. And then they slowly weather as the year goes on. And so with a 12-hour day, you can notice the difference in height between these little rosettes of unfurling leaves, between taking your first coffee of the morning and staggering wearily to your ride home. It was a really fun job. I enjoy it immensely. It makes such a difference. And it's a contemplative, thoughtful job. I was inspired on Tuesday to carry on looking at, looking at the particular fern because I wasn't at work on Tuesday, of course. And I found a fantastic manuscript online that any of you can read. It's in the Bodleian Library, and it is from about 500 years ago, almost exactly 500 years ago. It's a Tudor period, and it is described as a pattern book, i.e. a tool for people who want to illustrate manuscripts to, to draw pictures of plants but I don't, I don't think it is a pattern book to me it is more of an encyclopedia it's arranged alphabetically I think a pattern book would be more likely to to be like a scrapbook anyway who am I to, to quibble with the Bodleian Library if you search for MS Ashmole 1504 you'll find it or if you search for the Tudor pattern book you might find it as well and it is a collection of beautifully worked illustrations of British native plants with fantastical things going on around them with dogs and strange creatures and table settings, how to set the table. And the, the Asplenium scolopendrium, the heart's tongue fern, features among them. There's also a brilliant depiction of a broad bean. Our broad beans are in flower at work. And I stopped to look at the flower by, by chance as I was leaving on Monday and then to see it replicated so accurately in this manuscript. So if you're locked down at home and, and maybe the weather does change, maybe you're not going to go to the park or, or roll around naked in the garden. So maybe you want to go online and look at some Tudor manuscripts. Search for Bodley and MS Ashmole 1504 and you, you'll find a wonderful thing there. That took most of Tuesday, as you can imagine. On Wednesday, I was back at work searching for, for things that might have failed. All of the fruit trees are doing very well. Looks like we had heavy blossom on the pear tree, the one that I moved, and not the kind of despairing heavy blossom that sometimes a stressed tree will do. Uh, a sort of, oh cripes, this looks like it's going to be my last year, I might as well go out of a bang. This looked like sustainable, sustainable blossoming, and so I'm hoping that we get some, some pears for once. The cherry trees are out and looking magnificent. Those are the edible cherries that have grown to unsustainable proportions. There aren't many eaten by, by humans, I can tell you that. They tend to, to go on about 30 foot up in the air, food for the blackbirds. But I have floated the idea of putting in a, a line of smaller cherry trees this autumn, a line on dwarf rootstocks in the back of the orchard that we can construct some sort of netting around when it comes to, to harvest season. And hopefully we will we'll get a chance to, to taste the cherry. I think that fresh black cherries straight from the tree are probably one of the best things in the world. And if the gardeners can eat more of those, then that can only be a good thing. At the moment, I'd feel very guilty plucking them as I went along. If we have more, and they owe their existence solely to me, then, then surely I, I take rights to a certain proportion of them. I found the first lily beetles of the year, particularly early, but we would expect that. There's lots of bugs and things out and about. There's loads and loads and loads of green fly and all of the roses. And I know that every year it surprises me in the same way that the amount of them and how quickly they, they come. And I think that it is just a fact of life that roses have them. They still flower all right. If you can cope with a bit of stickiness and the possibility that the leaves might go sooty, moly and horrible later in the year, then you can live with it. Obviously, I can't live with that because because I'm paid to stop that sort of thing happening. So, so I've been taking various methods to, to get rid of them. And I used the same methods on the, the lily beetle, 
which is which is non-chemical, but not particularly reversible. Squashing, basically. Anyway, the lily beetles are out and about. I have some fantastic lily areas coming up. There's a great big cluster of them. I put in a shady area around hellebores and hamamelis. And these are these are 500 martagon lilies in various colours that I, that I bought at the end of last year. And everyone says that martagon lilies don't do well in their first year. But these ones are tipped with a really good cluster of little proto flower beds. So I think they're going to flower absolutely fine. They're still at the stage where they're, they're coming up as a as a sort of series of spiked leaves. They look a bit like that that tool for for puncturing holes in pasta. Have you seen it? It's a it's a lot of metal stars on a on a bolt that you run over the top of a bit of pasta. And if you turn that on the side, all of those stars looking down on the top of them would look like the lily leaf. I think they're a nice compliment as well to the to the hellebore leaf. They have that same that same rugged spiky bigness and the same fresh green colour and when things are that green when things are that newly emerged it really doesn't matter what the shape is i was also thinking of quiz questions we had a little group quiz that evening i only had one gardening question which i'm sure you will all get i asked them which common tree delights in the name fraxinus excelsior and i'm pleased to say that one person got that right so there is hope. No one got my geography question right, which was put these walls in order of the furthest north, the walls of Ston, the Great Wall of China, the Antonine Wall, and Hadrian's Wall. That was Wednesday, straight home from the 12th hour day, into the quiz, into bed, completely exhausted, but feeling satisfied. On Thursday, I was quarantined in my own garden, watching the aphids in my own roses, which I can allow to be as bug-covered as I jolly well like. I have a, a stone, or ceramic stone, patio outside the, the doors to the garden, and a large climbing rose with beautiful, beautiful ruffled salmon pink flowers that is currently speckling it with a lovely sticky patina. So if we start getting mosquitoes later in the year, they will all stick to my patio and none of them bite us at all. It's a, it's a very clever biological control method. On Friday, I was weeding. Two very different types of weeding, both very satisfying, I find. The first type of weeding I got stuck into in the morning, and that's the, the wheedling, nerdling sort of weeding, the kind of weeding that requires attention and a sharp, hoary, hoary knife or a thin cutting implement, I was working out a large patch of Enchanter's Nightshade and Violet Odorata. And if anyone knows these two plants, they look very, very similar. The leaves are almost identical when they come out. And the difference is that there is a slightly fleshier stem on the Enchanter's Nightshade, a, a red-toned petiole as well. Whereas the violet comes out on more of an epimedium-like, very thin, very thin petiole, almost wire-like. You think, how on earth can that be transporting water? It doesn't seem right. It's like transporting water through the middle of a, a strand of hair, but it, it does so somehow. You realise you make a mistake when you dig up a plant and you see no fleshy white root. Because the enchanter's nightshade has brilliant chalk white roots one of those roots that is like the the root of bindweed or ground elder it seems to not get dirty no matter how horrible the soil it comes out clean and uncoated like a strand of beautiful pure spaghetti broken from the the middle of a swamp it obviously has some mud repellent properties that that clothing companies should be looking into anyway i got stuck into that it's a job to lose hours to and I think only four or five violets succumbed to, to the end of the, the weeding knife. In the afternoon, I moved on to the creative type of weeding. I was taking out little seedlings of common poppy and cleome that have completely covered 
a bed, a bed that hasn't quite filled up yet. It will be will fill later. It's got it's got uh, emergent hostas and hackneycloa coming out, and hostas are still at that rolled up cigar paper stage. The hackneycloa is almost out. There's space is what I'm talking about. There's space that has been completely filled with these seedlings, and I want some of them. I like cleome, and I love the the common poppy, but I don't want lots of them, and I don't want them to look like they have got there without me knowing about them. I want to create the impression of myself as an almost omniscient force in the garden. And if there is a, a weedy species growing, it is because I want it to grow there. Giving this impression in, in certain areas means that I will get a lot more leeway when I make genuine mistakes, which I do all of the time. And so I, I took a, a sharp knife and kneeling down, using it as a hoe, I sliced back every little seedling within a foot of the edge of the border. This is to create a neat effect, but also because both the common poppy and cleum are, are, are quite tall, big plants, and they wouldn't look right near the front of the border. I also thinned anything that was near other plants that was getting in the way and just carved strips through these these emergent seedlings like I was hacking through through a jungle except I was not a man-sized thing I was a deforesting cattle ranchers bulldozer type thing it was extremely satisfying and left quite a quite a decent effect it's sort of the the complementary science to to giving a a border a neat edge, making sure the grass is clipped away nicely. And with that, I was done. The first week back completed. I had a beer in the sunshine, in the garden, as is traditional, at the end of a, a working Friday. And that was sad and poignant because it would have been nice to be drinking with my colleagues. But if the health of the nation and the health system require me to drink alone, then I will drink alone. Let's see if I have any recommendations for you this week. that I gave my manuscript recommendation earlier in the podcast, so we can't use that one. I promise that I am going to answer the questions that I got to send in. Thank you very much if you did send me questions. They were all wonderful. I am going to be putting out a special questions episode, which will be numbered and titled differently from, from the other ones in the feed, and will be entirely full of, of listener-submitted content. So look out for that in the future. Don't worry, I am not ignoring those. My other recommendation is a bit of fun. It's along the quiz lines, and it is on the Garden Museum website, which I believe is gardenmuseum.org. On their blog, they have a couple of posts up called The Great Garden Hunt, and basically they're going through their archives. They have a huge amount of clippings and boxes. I remember from when I used to work there, this, this fantastic store of stuff, and they get donated things all the time. Someone says, well, well Auntie Dahlia... Like gardens, how on earth can I get rid of this stuff? It seems a bit wrong to throw her life's work in the skip. We'll send it to the Garden Museum. And they're going through that collection and they have found some unlabeled black and white photographs from, I'd say, 19th century, maybe Edwardian photographs. And they're looking for people who might recognise the gardens in them. There was one about public parks. I was hoping that I would be able to recognise something, but I had nothing at all. And then this week there are various pictures of stately homes and their gardens and they would like anyone who might recognize one to contact them so that is on the gardenmuseum.org on their blog pages the stately home one i imagine being quite tricky because an awful lot of stately homes have been knocked down particularly those ones that we can no longer identify so so good luck with that go and search for those ghost gardens those those now housing estate gardens the last thing i'd like to mention is I have set up a, a Ko-Fi or coffee account. Uh, you can go on there and click a button and it buys a little virtual coffee. 
i.e. makes a, a small donation if you would like to say thank you for anything you've heard over the last three years then you can do that at ko-fi that's k-o hyphen f-i slash ben dog it only remains for me to say that i hope you have a, a wonderful week whether you are gardening or not remember in times like these it's okay to not do anything to waste the day in thought or not thought or random jogging around the internet clicking on bits and pieces and suddenly it's time for bed there is no shame in it the gardens are still out there the pubs are still out there we will be back in them again one day take care of yourselves thank you very much and goodbye Thank you.